you know, I was trying to run away from the, my struggles when I was younger. And what I found, especially being from the, the deep south, and the older I got, the more I realized that, I, that you, can't, you can't outrun the place that you're from. This is Live at the Hall from the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum. This week, Michael Gray talks with singer-songwriter Charlie Crockett. In a champagne room on the TV They say that we're all through and there's an ashtray Full of cigarettes talking to me Are we lonesome yet? You caught me staring at the chandelier No, I ain't crying Smoke it, cause these tears This place is crowded Folks, they seem upset I'm just smiling Are we lonesome yet? In here there's a price to pay It costs a lot more to stay Nobody wants to share Who told you this town was fair? Tell me are we lonesome yet? I just can't forget The voice talking in my head Are we lonesome yet? Somebody's talking in the mezzanine up the staircase and past the ice machine. I barely hear them judging me and just I think I'll ask them, are we lonesome yet? Big old city, you show been hard on me, filled up with people. As far as you can see, electric billboards selling what comes next. They're really saying, are we lonesome yet? In here, there's a price to pay. It costs a lot more to stay. Nobody wants to share Who told you this town was fair Tell me are we lonesome yet I just can't forget The voice asking in my head Are we lonesome yet Are we lonesome yet Tell me are we lonesome yet Charlie Crockett, welcome to the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum and our CMA Theater. And we really appreciate you being part of our Live at the Hall series. And um, this year you're a part of the museum's American Currents exhibit, which uh, basically focuses on uh, the most significant developments of the, of the previous year. And there's a part of that exhibition called Unbroken Circle, where we pair a uh, current contemporary artist with one of their mentors, somebody that influenced them. And of course, we paired you with the great late Freddie Fender. And so I just thought we could start by talking about Freddie and um, really right from the beginning, when did you even become aware of, of Freddie Fender? Well, I want to thank you, Michael, for having me on. And uh, this means a, a lot to me to be here. It really does. So thank you. And uh, well, I, I knew about Freddie from the time I could walk. And I think he, I seen him play. Uh, my mama worked at a TV station down there in the, in the valley, right near where we lived, outside of San Benito. I was born in San Benito, but we lived outside of a small town, a smaller town in San Benito called Los Fresnos. She worked at KVEO and she did the weather and stuff like that. And uh, so she would take me to see the taping of the Johnny Canales show and of course Freddie you know he's really the king of the valley and he still is and uh, you know I've said this before you know I, I think that you know the, the, the more you you know I was trying to run away from the, my struggles when I was younger 
And what I found, especially being from the, the deep south, is the further a field I wandered, the and the older I got, the more I realized that I that you can't you can't outrun the place that you're from. And one day I think I stopped running from it and turned around and, and embraced it. And things started changing for me when I did that. And uh, you know, when I was a kid, Freddie was 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 everywhere and he was everything. And then as I got older. I forgot about him a little bit as America did with kind of fading, you know, country stars of that earlier era. But um, my life just kept running back into him. Even if I was just in a thrift store, like him and Charlie Pride, one thing I would notice anywhere you'd go, especially in Texas, but anywhere in America, you go in a thrift store anywhere and flip through the records. And there's just so much Freddie Fender and Charlie Pride, which part of that's a testament to how many records they sold. You know, and they both broke a lot of records. Uh, and um, also as, you know, I progressed with street performing and my experience of cutting my teeth in New Orleans and coming back to Texas, those things, um, I just kept running back into Freddie. And uh, when I got a little older and started looking more at his music, I started, you know, recognizing his early work, you know, as a LB Bop kid. And the way that he could, I mean, he really pioneered a version of rock and roll that I really think we're yet to uncover in America, you know? And I think in that way, it makes him as important as Chuck Berry, especially for the cultural significance of Texas and then more specifically being Mexican American, a Tejano, especially from Rio Grande Valley, which is a very isolated place that, you know, doesn't get the kind of recognition that maybe other places do like Mississippi Delta or the Appalachia, you know what I mean? So, um, and of course, you know, when people would ask me where I was from, you know, you could say San Benito and even in Texas, they wouldn't know where that is. But if you said you were from the same town as Freddie Fender, um, they'd be more likely to know what I was talking about. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> well said. I mean, I mean, given your very, you know, kind of unique background, you know, your, your uh, backstory as a street performer, it seems like that you're approaching your music and your career different than anyone else out there right now. You and, think so? And, yeah, and, and I mean, I guess I'm curious about, um, you know, and then I'm talking about like mainstream country or Americana or, or anyone. I mean, and, and I mean, so do you see kind of like parallels be, between your life and career and, 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 and Freddie's? Yeah. Well, there's no doubt. We were both born in the same town. We both really figured out our sound in New Orleans, you know, and you could really argue that the birthplace of a lot of America's music really comes out of that town where the Mississippi River washes out into the Gulf, right? Um, both got in a lot of trouble with the law. Uh, both got out of it because of people in those legal systems liking our music, you know? He had it a lot harder than me, but, uh, you know, had my fair share of trouble. And um, also being associated with country music because see, as a street performer, and I can't speak for Freddie, Freddie Fender, but I would imagine that being the type of kind of innovator that he was, you're pulling from so many types of sounds. So like Americana music, for example, I had never associated that term with anything but a breed of chicken until maybe, you know, six, seven years ago, you know, I just, I was unaware. I was a street person, you know, and um, my identity was to the blues because that was the stuff on the street and in bars um, and around the roots musicians that, that I spent time with. That was the that was the the sound and the music that that they identified where I was coming from. And, um, you know, as I've been associated with country music more and more. Um, I grew to be proud of that in, you know, in the idea, of, I think what makes it, I think what makes it, you know, I'm, I bring so many styles with me and I think anybody who's doing something different does, you know, but it take you need to be bringing a lot of tradition with you really, I think to be a true innovator. Um, but the real thing for me, especially on the street, as I started learning drinking songs and 
like murder ballads is the storytelling. I think that's what makes, I think you can look at country music because to me country music is, is really just, you know, uh, a melting pot of root styles, but I think it's the storytelling in the songs that really makes it country, you know? And I think, you know, Freddie eventually figured that out and however he got there. And, uh, you know, that's the difference for me too, is like, you know, it's blues. I see myself as somebody who's rooted in, in being a blues singer and learning how to play music and express myself to other musicians uh, by thinking of it as the blues, you know? but. Um, you know, we, you know, they call me country. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Charlie, you just said something about, um, something along the lines of you have to understand traditional music to be an innovator. I think that's very interesting. And it reminds me of, um, something that, uh, is it Doreen, the jazz queen in New Orleans, some advice she gave you, what was that advice? Um, her advice was, you know, to, well, so we played on Royal Street, me and a guy named um, Charlie Mills, Charles Mills Jr., I call him. Uh, we met well over a decade ago on Toulouse and Royal Street as both playing solo, and I would come in and out of town, and I lived off and on in, in New Orleans as a kid with my uncle. And so I had been around a quarter and been around street musicians when I was a child, but I, you know, I didn't play then. And then at some point as I, you know, become itinerant, I started, I, after coming down from New York, I ended up in New Orleans. And we was out there real ragtag, you know, and I really hope if there's any video from way back then, not too much of it surfaces, because it really wasn't very good. Very rough around the edges, I'd say, you know. It's the old lump of coal, I guess. But uh, some of the older heads, some of the, some of the older, more seasoned street performers uh, took a liking to us, you know, and Doreen, and her husband, Tuba Sexy, had a family band and they would really hold down the spot in front of Rouse's grocery store there at St. Peter's in, in Royal. And uh, sometimes they would let us play in their spot when they were like out of town because they would travel around the world. Doreen is an amazing world renowned uh, clarinet player and she could sing and, and a whole band. I mean, I remember her daughter at eight years old was playing drums for the family band, you know, the jazz stuff. I mean, you know, this, you, know you, you can't, this stuff's in the water. Uh, and she pulled, her and her husband pulled me and Charlie Mills aside one day and she said, you know, you guys really got something, but you all need to learn this traditional music because wherever you're trying to take yourself, this is gonna help you get there. And something about the way she said that and the timing and also Charlie Mills, you know, was really encouraging me and putting traditional uh, New Orleans jazz music in front of me. Um, and I couldn't read music or anything, but eventually I, I did learn the chords and stuff. Um, I found that to be true, man. Like it, in, in, in the quarter, man, it would be like, you know, there'd be traditional jazz bands. There'd be these jug bands playing nothing but spirituals and old folk songs, Hank Williams stuff. I, I learned how to play Hank Williams songs off a of Cajun uh, kid in the street. You know, uh, I learned how, I learned about Ernest Tubb songs on the street in New Orleans. And uh, on the street, you learn songs that that pay. You learn songs that make people move, that keep people's attention. Uh, and that's what I what that's what I learned in New Orleans. You know, but I think the kind of the standards. You know the. I don't know what's up. There's so much in my head when it comes to that type of stuff. It's like, yeah. yeah, I don't know, man. You know, you just, you know, you learn how to play. Like country music, for example, it's like, it's kind of like old jazz standards. Why I like classic country and how I learned so much of that stuff in the street is it's a lot like jazz and pop standards, but it's more simplified. And from a young age, I singing folk music and traditional music was something that came natural to me as a child, even singing with my mama. And so when, when I realized that, you know, that all of this great music, whether we're talking about, you know, Ray Charles or Loretta Lynn, it's really based on, on these simple song forms from folk, from folk music of the yesteryear. And that gave me the confidence 
you know, to be able to write, start writing songs, you know, and, and not just, you know, not just, you know, not just playing in the street trying to buy a meal, you know. You saw my photograph as you was walking in and in the chasing to the world I'm living in. I've got my clean shirt starched up all brand new. I'm about to do see do because my bills are all due. Cowboy candy. Cowboy candy. Yeah, yeah. Boy, candy when I get up, and if they call my name, I hope I have enough. It's sure to make this suffering just a disappear, and then you see me smiling from air to air, cowboy. You just had to become so resourceful, but you were open to all this music and absorbing all this music. You know, I, I know that at some point, um, people who were writing about you were like referring to you as like a stylistic chameleon. And I think that at first maybe bothered you. How do you feel about that now when people kind of describe you that way? Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, when they first started calling George Jones, who's the king of country music, by the way, when they started calling him the possum, you know, or like No Show Jones, of course, at first he, he didn't like that. And then later he, you know, he put it on t-shirts and, and, and sold it on, on tours. So initially it, it bothered me because I, I guess I kind of knew inside that, that I was pulling from so many directions that it becomes difficult to classify, you know? Um, and I think maybe back in the day, the way that I got here was how most everybody got here but maybe it's not as much like that anymore. So, you know, like Loretta Lynn said, you know, you're, you're either, you know, you're either the first or the best or you're different. And, uh, well, I'm most certainly different. And, you know, I, I, I started to, you know, you go from, I went from being like, man, it's a chameleon, you know, like 
you know, that means I don't have an identity, you know, and then you, and then I look at it being like, well, man, this is who I am. Like, I can play blues. I can play soul. I can sing gospel. You know, I can really do, all, I can really sing any kind of style, you know, um, and I have come to find that, especially in, in 1960s country music, and I know that there's a lot of people that don't want to talk about, you know, country music in the 60s for all kinds of reasons, but the to me, that was a high point in the, at least in the creative aspect of how they were making country records in the ways that they that it borrowed from R and B and and soul and from and from uh, pop and traditional, you know, and hillbilly and um, they were really using all that stuff behind it. Like if you're listening to George Jones sing, you know, you may not realize that those beats that that pattern that's being played behind him is a lot less traditional on a lot of that stuff than people would think. And so I, I think one day I looked at it and I said, you know, maybe, maybe, I, maybe a lot of people were stylistic chameleons, you know, that, that got here, you know, at least the people that I look up to, mm. you know, so I'm proud of that now. In fact, I'm, I think I might put a picture of a <laughs> chameleon on a t-shirt, <laughs> you know, I need a new design. <laughs> um, can we talk about Lazy Lester for a minute? Yeah, I just just recently learned that you that you knew him. He, yeah. um, you know, um, of course, he's kind of known for that Louisiana swamp blues, and um, and he recorded in, in Louisiana. But his records actually came out of a Nashville label called Accelo That's Records, right. that you know that licensed that material. And and we recently did a, a program about the history of Accelo Records, and we were trying to get Lazy Lester, and this was a few years ago, and he had just was just getting ill and mm. just recently just passed away a, a few years ago at, at the age of 85 but like tell me about lazy lester how did you get to know him how, what kind of influence did he have on well you? i didn't know i couldn't say i know him knew him well but i did get to meet him a handful of times because of uh my friend jay moeller uh who is a musician down in austin texas a, a drummer who really got me my start recording uh the string of records that I put out in the, in, in, in the last few years. He also gave me my nickname, uh, Lil GL, after this other obscure R&B guy. It's kind of like a, has a cult following for 45s he put out named GL Crockett. Oh. Um, but uh, Jay, would, Jay played drums for, for uh, Lazy Lester. And so I would go see, uh, I'd go see them anytime they were playing at Antone's. And he was somebody that I really, looked up to for a lot of the things that we're talking about right now with it, you know, and uh, what he would tell me is that he really loved playing country music. But when he was on Excello and those labels back in that time, you know, like we were talking about, it's like when they, when they, you know, people want to, want to classify you. They want to be able, you know, they want to be able to identify or pigeonhole you. And people don't necessarily mean anything negative by it. It's just people want to simplify it. And so he was saying that the confines, of the sound that he'd been known for was made it difficult for him to be able to just sing country music. But if you go see him live, he would do all kinds of country stuff, you know, and like Waylon Jennings said, I mean, country and soul about a, just about a beat apart, you know, so anybody, whether you Waylon or Lazy Lester, it's like, we learned how to do all this stuff together. You know, even the guys on the street that taught Hank Williams what he knew, it was really, you know, it was really, you know, dancing country dancing songs that that made money on the street in montgomery alabama you know and so you know with with, with lazy lester he he told me that on on multiple occasions you know he really loved country music i think the most um i always just thought he was so he just had such an identifiable like unique sound like my favorite thing he ever recorded was a uh, sad city blues oh, yeah. it, it's just such good stuff you know he was so He's just so, uh, you know, some people have a voice that you cannot instantly recognize it, you know, and that was him for me, you know, and uh, so being around him, getting to see him play, he was funny too, man. He wore a belt buckle. Last time I saw him, he I looked, he was like standing at the entrance to the end zones, and I looked down at the man's belt buckle, and it was a pic he, it was his own picture <laughs> on his belt buckle, yeah. and he was a funny guy, and he wore boots and, and Wranglers and was real tall and was just a, was the funniest, sweetest man. And I always thought it was like really wild, you know, because when he passed, he was living in Paradise, California. And then six months after he passed, that town burnt to the ground. Oh, that's right. You know, yeah, so well, I always yeah. thought, I guess he just knew it was time to go or something. Yeah. But, um, 
Yeah, big fan of everything, actually. I mean, I understand, I understand him feeling uh, maybe that, you know, Excello maybe was narrow for where he wanted to go, but I always loved everything he did on Excello. And, uh, yeah. I'm a lover, not a fighter. Was, yeah, was man, that stuff's yeah. amazing, man. <laughs> yeah. And uh, everything, you know, uh, Slim Harpo did. Yeah. And I don't even know if you know, but like on a lot of those recordings, there's not a drum kit. It's a literally an upside down cardboard box and a rolled up newspaper. And that's Lazy Lester playing that on a lot of those famous recordings. Wow. Yeah. You know? <laughs> oh, man, wish we would, could have had him here at the Hall of Fame talking about his love for country music. But, th you but thank too. you for talking well, about Well, I can him tell before. you that that's, yeah. that was yeah. the deal. And he, and I, last time I watched him play, man, he must have, I mean, he just, I mean, he, he rolled through so much classic country. You know, it, it was cool to see, you know, he just reminded me of the, of the street performers that just had that kind of repertoire, you know? Yeah. yeah. You, you, you had mentioned this string of albums that you're putting out and that's, I mean, you know, most artists, you know, earlier, I, you know, I was talking about how you, you're approaching your career a lot different than most artists. And, and one of those ways is the amount of uh, recordings you're putting out. I mean, you know, most artists like time it one album a year or so or, or every two years. Yeah, you know? lucky. Yeah, yeah. And you're I mean, wow, you've what, you, what you're on like your 11th album and and how many years like, you know, uh, Music, Music City Zen, USA yeah. will be number 10. Number 10. Yeah. yeah. And then I have the 11th record. Uh, in the can, yeah. you know, and so we'll roll that out. Uh, yeah. Hey, man, look, George Jones put out six records in 1966, 67. Now, Pappy Daly was crazy <laughs> as all get out, and we know that. But, you know, I don't think that it's that, I think it's the business that has changed and slowed everything down. Because, you know, I was talking to a, I was talking to a, a journalist on the phone in Birmingham the other day and he was asking me the same stuff everybody does and I said did you know that when Johnny Cash put out the album I Walked the Line which was 64 65 that was his 19th studio album what I would argue is these young folks getting put into this machine they get chewed up and spit out before they ever get a chance to even develop I've literally had people fly over from Europe trying to sign me telling me that an artist's career in the modern era is, you know, seven years and three records. I can't abide by that, you know? And, you know, I know that Nashville was a factory back in the day, but it was, you know, it was different, you know? I mean, Waylon put out so many records with Chet Atkins, you know, Owen Bradley and them, I mean, they worked so hard, you know? It was all about the music. I mean, Loretta Lynn put out two or three records a year you know, and it's like, I'm 37 now, I got a late start because I was on the street so long. And uh, I tend to think, I have a hard time looking at things from a small perspective and I get confused and a struggle in that place, but I can look at things from a distance and try to separate myself from the, from the business. You know, I'm, when I'm 60 years old, you know, I just wanna be sure that I got in there and I made it happen. Like when I had it in me, the fire in me to do it, you know, and I, 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 I can't let anybody slow that down or take that away from me, you know, because they had less tools back then and they worked that hard. And now we got all the tools in the world and it's so slow, you know, and I just, like I said, I just, I, I ain't blaming anybody. I can't abide by that. You know, that's, that's not my style. That's not my style. Well, you and you talk about the fire, though. I mean, the, these these songs just must be flowing out of you right now. You went, you know, you came in and were gracious enough to perform some songs today, and you were performing songs that I think you literally just wrote in the past few weeks that yeah. aren't haven't even been recorded yet. Yeah, one of know? them is just a few days old. You know, I well, I I don't know. You know, I you go to you play in a town and you meet people and you see the bright lights of these big cities and. You see the folks in the world places and all of the the struggles and the issues in America. And I just, uh, well, I'd have to be dead not to be able to write songs off that, you know? So, um, and that's the other thing too, you know, because I like the way that the major labels used to work back then, you know? So if you signed with RCA in the 60s, if you signed with Excello, you know, contractually, they were gonna, they were gonna record two, three, four albums a year on you, you know, and you'd sign a contract where they had the right to do that. Um, 
I'm not saying that that was necessarily a good situation. We know that all these, you know, they worked all these fools to death in a lot of ways, but, but, but that made people great. You know, that hard work, hard work and determination make you great. You know, I think it can make you great. I don't, I think it's harder to get, like I'm saying, sometimes I feel bad for people who get run through the, the machine today because I just think, and I've, been, I've dealt with it, you know, I, I was signed on subway cars in New York City over 10 years ago, you know, truth be told, I got all kinds of crazy people coming at me, offering me the same deal that they would have offered me on the street without 10 records out, you know, which uh, I'm not even mad at them for that. I do think it's funny that they don't do enough homework to realize that I'm not their guy when it comes to that type of stuff. But I hate to see people get hit by the business in a way that they're so disillusioned that they don't ever get to, to tap into that. You know, um, I'd like to see more of that type of um, authenticity get developed within, you know, these labels and stuff. But, you know, I don't have a magic wand for that, you know, and I, I don't have a taste or interest in being somebody doing that work in the business. I can only really put my energy to my, to, towards my own stuff, you know, and like Willie Nelson, how many records does that man have out? 77 records, you know? I, I want I, Ernest Tubb. I want to have I want to record 50 records, you know, and, and it got to be a good song in there. <laughs> <laughs> but what did Merle Haggard say, man? What did he say? He said he wrote 300 songs before he ever wrote a good one. You know, these folks ain't even writing 300 songs in their whole career. Not all of them, but a lot of people these days. And I and, and I ain't even blaming anybody. I just, you know, I don't know where it comes from, you know, because I'm really I'm I'm really not that that good at writing songs, but, but I just stay on it, you know, and I just stay on it. And plus I get bored, man. Like, you know, I mean, I got this record rolling out and I'm real proud of it, but it's like coming in here to play for y'all, I'm nervous, but I want to play this stuff that's brand new to me, you know, and, 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 and maybe we could capture that on camera, you know, and, and that's how I live my life. Well, thank you very much, man. This has been this has been fun. So Am I testifying? Did yeah. I testify? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, man? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, this one here, you know, I, I played on the street for a long time, uh, about ten years, and uh, actually, I walked into this guitar pool in Manhattan a bunch of years back. Now, probably, I don't know, twelve, thirteen years ago, and. Uh, I was in way over my head, you know, I really wasn't any good and didn't have no business being in that joint. And, uh, but after the fact, come to find out that I was in the same room as uh, Ramblin' Jack Elliott. And uh, like I said, I didn't have any business being there, but from that day forward, I kind of more and more became aware of him and really consider him one of the great uh, folk singers in, in America. And uh, I think I was in Montana hoboing through a bunch of years back, and I heard this song here called uh, Diamond Joe. Let's see if I can get it right. There is a man you'll hear about most any place you go And his holdings are in Texas And his name is Diamond Joe He carries all his money In a diamond-studded jaw And he never was much bothered By the process of the law Hired out to Diamond Joe, boys I did offer him my hand And he gave me a string of horses So old they couldn't stand I like to starve to death, boys He did mistreat me so I never saved a dollar In the pay of Diamond Joe
Now his bread it was corn dodger And his meat I couldn't chaw And it kept me well distracted With the wagging of his jaw And the telling of his stories I aim to let you know There never was a rounder Who lied like Diamond Joe And I tried three times to quit him, boys But he did argue so And I'm still punching cattle In the pay of Diamond Joe But when I'm caught up a yonder And it come my time to go Give my blankets to my buddies And give the fleas to Diamond Joe 